Section A10 is Communications and Operations Management, and it's actually the biggest section of ISO 27001. It alone has 10 subsections, and every one of those 10 subsections has multiple clauses, so it's a huge part of the standard. Communications and Operations is, by and large, an IT issue. Uh, this is the communications and operations environment probably of your IT system in your organisation, and there are a lot of clauses under this section. A lot of them are common sense, and even for someone who's not au fait technically with IT areas, you can understand what the standard is looking for. It's asking, for example, for common, common practices to perhaps be proceduralized, for procedures or policies to be set out of what should happen so everyone is clear and everyone follows the same process. It also talks about monitoring, for example, monitoring your activities to make sure that what people are doing is, is appropriate and that uh, there's no uh, activities going on which the organisation would be uh, unhappy with. However, there are a number of sections under comms and ops which are not directly related to IT and those are the ones I want to focus on because it's important you understand them. The first one is called information exchange agreements and again it's a new section of the standard since 2005 so there's made not an awful lot of experience with it and it is a, potentially a huge area. What this is actually saying is that when you exchange information on any sort of regular basis with a third party you may need to look at setting up formal exchange agreements. Now again most people will consider that and maybe think of email or potentially sending information through the post to someone and yes it does cover those and it will be asking you are there any risks associated with that and if so should you be putting in controls such as registered mail or secure couriers for example but it also goes into many more aspects than that and if you look at the guidance in 27002 you'll find that it's talking about things like telephones for example and fax machines all of which are means of communicating information and potentially could have huge security risks unless they're appropriately managed. But again, because this section is called communications and operations, those sort of subtleties are often overlooked. The other area I just wanted to draw attention to is A10-2, which is a subsection which deals with third parties and management of third parties. And again, this is a new subsection to the standard since 2005. There's three clauses under it, and basically what it's saying is that you've got to set up a process to manage your suppliers or contractors, particularly when those contractors are supporting your IT infrastructure. So it's looking for an SLA or service level agreement or a contract to be put in place. It's looking for someone to be set up with specific responsibility to monitor the provision of that contract and make sure that your supplier is living up to their expectations or sorry, your expectations in terms of their service delivery. It also, the third clause, is making sure that if there is a subsequent change to that contract or somebody, you go to your contractor and say, look, can you do this for us as well? And they say, oh yeah, we'll build that in. That actually is formally documented somewhere and set out. And again, it was brought in because it, there's a recognition that this was a problem historically, that as you build a relationship with a contractor, you can go to them and simply keep asking them to do more and more for you. And yet when something goes wrong, there's no document, there's no record, or there's no agreement in place saying exactly what was requested and what should have been delivered. The communications and operations management uh, section of the standard is something I'm very familiar with coming from a 14, actually 15 years background in IT. Um, and traditionally that was the case, it was always the IT people looked after communications and operations. That's simply not the case. Um, as I moved into the, more into the extra 27,000, I want to understand what exactly it's looking for. It's not looking for operational controls for um, your IT equipment, your processing facilities. Obviously it does look for that, but communications and operations also covers other things there and other aspects there. And one that I found very interesting was the exchange of information. Okay, you've built the environment, you've secured the environment. What happens to the information within that environment? You've protected the law, and then it leaves. What happens to it when it leaves? Is there an agreement in place? Is there something there in place to protect that information? You may have a classified. Does anybody else understand what that classification is? So it, when we come down to communications and operations, I understand, and people should understand, that yes, it is what you do and how you do it daily. That's ex essentially what it is. But also, you have to look at the non-technical controls. And as an auditor, that's exactly what I'll be looking for. Communications and operations is, is one of the the, the bedrocks in the entire standard, it, there is an awful lot of detail in it, there is an awful lot of requirement in there to have particular policies and procedures. It is one of those key areas of the standard where it says the organisation shall have a policy for this or the organisation shall develop a procedure for that and the organisation building an ISMS should really follow what the standard says. So um, A10, which is 
communications and operations is very detailed and thorough and should be gone through in every detail by the organisation.